Good morning. Good morning. We're glad to see you all here. Just a few announcements to start with. Uh, this afternoon, there's a memorial service for the Schimmels. Uh, everyone is welcome to come. Uh, please notice all of the announcements in the bulletin and as they're on the screen. Uh, there's a confirmation class coming up in October, uh, Muffins with Mom in August, and August 9th, I believe it is. Uh, those that are able, please stand as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Oh, I'm sorry. Prelude first. You may sit for that unless you feel like you need the exercise. Sorry about that. Now that we're in the right mindset, let's stand and come to worship God. Create in us pure hearts, O God, and renew in each of us a steadfast spirit. Do not cast us away from your presence. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Open our lips, O God, and our mouths will declare your praise. Let us hear joy and gladness. Our tongues will sing of your righteousness. Let Let's worship God. God.
Please be seated. Grace and peace to you in the name of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm Chip Hardwick. I'm so glad to be here to worship with you today. I am the interim executive of the Synod of the Covenant, and you are a super Presbyterian if you happen to know what the Synod of the Covenant is. <laughs> so we've got the churches. The churches are part of presbyteries, so you're part of Detroit Presbytery. Then the next geographic level up is called the Synod, which are all the, for us, all the churches in Ohio and Michigan. Then the next level up is the General Assembly, the National Church. So now you're all super Presbyterians. And so I bring you greetings from the 100,000 Presbyterians and about 700 churches that are in our synod. Our synod works to strengthen Presbyterians and churches and I hope that in some small way, my being here will help strengthen your church. So God bless you and thank you so much for having me here this morning. We were just able to sing in this song, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. In the fourth verse, it starts out, Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore him. And that is a great goal, to let everything in us adore God. But we don't reach that goal. We fall short of what God wants for us. We do not adore him with what we say and with what we do. We sin. We need to ask forgiveness, and when we do, we have confidence that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will grant us that forgiveness as we put our faith in him. So knowing that good news of the gospel that we are forgiven, let us turn to God and confess our sins. O oh God, just as you gave manna to your people in the wilderness, you have given us everything we need. With abundant generosity, you have answered our prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Yet we still look for other ways to be satisfied. We pursue wealth or power, romance or professionalism. We mistake so many things for your bread of life. Forgive us for these and all our sins. Strengthen us to turn away from them and to turn toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's lift up silent prayers of confession to God. We pray in Christ's name, amen. The psalmist assures us that when we ask for forgiveness, God cleans us with hyssop. We are new through and through. The good news of the gospel is that our sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God, amen. Uh, today's Old Testament reading is from Exodus 16, verses two and four, through four, 9 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out of this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instructions or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard our comp your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness and the glory of, God, and the, glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat and in the morning you shall have your fill of the bread. Then you shall know 
that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. I've got to tell you kids that if I was in the middle of a children's sermon and trying to melt ice and the preacher pulled out a hot air blower, I would not have as much patience as you did. So I just want to congratulate you for that. Our New Testament scripture comes from the book of John. It's John 6, 24 through 35. This passage comes just after the um, feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus and his disciples have gone across the lake. And then the crowd that was fed follow him there. So let's listen to God's word to us. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So I wonder if any of you remember the old ad campaign for Snickers. Was Snickers really satisfies, right? Snickers really satisfies. I was looking around online yesterday and I saw a bunch of videos. I wish I had known you had screens here and I would have shown you one of them. They were hilarious. Those were from the 80s and they have these people saying, oh boy, I could hardly get through the day at the office. It was so terrible. I could never make it. But then I ate a Snickers and everything went great. Snickers really satisfies. A few years ago, I was in an adult Sunday school class and I asked the class to say what really satisfies them. And they had all sorts of answers. They, one person said a cold bath and somebody else said a warm bath. Nobody said a tepid bath, a cold bath or a warm bath. Somebody said um, chocolate. Somebody else said good memories. Somebody said getting exercise. Somebody, um, let's see, what else did they say? They said good memories. Um, someone said that um, doing everything decently and in order made her satisfied, a good Presbyterian. Um, somebody else said that being obsessive is no way to, be, um, to get satisfied. They had all sorts of answers about what satisfied them. Now, before you think that these people were a bunch of irreligious, good-for-nothings that couldn't even come up with obvious answers like praying, living out our faith, reading the Bible, they were sitting in a Sunday school class and they could not even come up with those answers, you should know that I asked them not to give any religious answers. I wanted to see what else they would come up with. Maybe just to make myself feel better. Because after all, when I'm honest, even though I'm a preacher, I would tell you that there are a lot of things that I turn to first to try to get satisfied. I might watch a favorite TV show. I might go for a bike ride or go for a jog or for a walk. I might call up a good friend. There are plenty of things that I do rather than working first to feed the poor or to pray. And I have a feeling that I'm not the only one here that struggles with that. I think for all of us, it's a real challenge to turn to our faith in Christ to seek satisfaction rather than other things around us. 
Well, I'm not sure if it's good news or bad news, but the fact is that we're not the first people who have struggled with this. All the way back in our Gospel of John 2,000 years ago, we see people that are struggling to listen to Jesus' word that he is the one that can really satisfy them. Just the day before, Jesus has fed 5,000 people. That's about twice the population of Orchard Lake. So about 5,000 people Jesus has fed with five loaves and two fish. And then he takes off with his disciples across the lake. We were, they were telling me this morning that they came across the lake and we were imagining, I said, what's on the other side of the lake? And they said, the country club. So we can imagine that the country club, the 5,000 people are at the country club. They've just been fed and they wonder where Jesus went. And when they realize that he came across the lake, they come across the lake too because they've had such a good meal the day before that they want some more of that food. And Jesus tries to redirect them. Jesus tells them that they shouldn't look for the food that spoils, but should look for food that endures, the bread of life, the bread of heaven. Jesus is trying to get them to realize that he can satisfy them like nothing else can. And so to do that, he uses the analogy of bread, right? Because bread back in those days was their absolute staple. It's what they ate every single day. Day. That's why we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Because bread is, is and was the most important part of their life. These days, we don't eat bread that much. Not like they did back then. Maybe if Jesus were speaking to us now, here, maybe he would tell us that he is the electricity of life. Or the water filter of life to make sure we have good water. Maybe... Since we're in Detroit, maybe he would say, we're the car, I'm the car of life. You can't imagine going, having a world without a car. Somebody told me maybe he would say, I am the caffeine of life, because that's the only way that people can get through the day. So he might not tell us that I am the bread of life, but you've got to admit that there's just something about good bread, right? There's just something about good bread. Is anybody here watching their carbs? Anybody here trying not to eat a lot of carbs? Okay, I see somebody out there, a couple people over there. You have to admit that there is nothing like a good loaf of bread. I was um, with some friends of mine once, and they were telling me about this bread they made, and we got to make it together. So they, they took, they didn't make the loaf. They bought a loaf of that really good, substantial Italian bread. And it was this whole long process. First, they sliced it into nice, thick slices, and then they put it on the grill to grill it. Then they took garlic cloves and rubbed it on the bread. And then they took some olive oil and poured a little bit of olive oil. Are you hungry yet? And then they took salt and put it on top. I mean, it was this long process, but it was so delicious. I found myself as I was eating it, I thought, why would I ever eat Wonder Bread again if I could have bread like this? Why would I ever do that? And that's what Jesus was asking those people back then. Why would you ever go for food that spoils when you can have the bread of life? Jesus asked them that, and Jesus asks us the same thing. Why settle for Wonder Bread when you can have Italian garlic bread on the grill? And the problem is we, we keep looking to things that would seem to satisfy us. And Jesus wants to direct our attention away from those things and on to him. Because the thing is, things that seem to satisfy actually don't. When I was poking around on the internet and found those videos of, about Snickers really satisfying, I also found this article came up. It's from a website called Truth in Advertising. And the headline was, Do Snickers really satisfy? And here's what it said. One Snickers bar, how many grams of sugar do you all think is in a Snickers bar? 27. One Snickers bar contains 27 grams of sugar. How many grams of fiber do you think is in a Snickers bar? One. One gram of fiber. So 27 grams of sugar with four grams of protein and one gram of fiber. Studies suggest foods loaded with simple sugars ultimately leave you more hungry. 
Eat a Snickers bar and your blood sugar will spike and then plummet, leaving you more hungry than when you started, suggests science. And the thing is, it's not just Snickers bars that try to trick us, right? There's all sorts of things that try to fool us into thinking they can satisfy us when really they can't. Maybe it's thinking, well, if I just had a better standard of living or, or more stuff, then I would finally be satisfied. One of my favorite social commentators, Madonna, she puts it this way. She says, I'm so happy with what I've got, I want more. I'm so happy with what I've got, I want more. Maybe you find yourself thinking, I know I do, I'm single, I find myself, well, if I could just get into the right relationship, then I would finally be satisfied. Some people pursue the thrill of an affair and they think maybe this, um, this adventure will make me satisfied. Or some people try to mask their problems with drugs or alcohol and they think maybe that'll do it. Then there's the idea of achieving. People think, well, maybe when I finally get to this level, once I finally achieved my way into being the grandmother I want to be, being the, the coworker I want to be, being the church volunteer I want to be, maybe then I'll finally be satisfied. We got a surprising message about this this last week in the Olympics when Simone Biles, who is widely recognized as the best gymnast in history when she decided that she would not compete because she has what's called the twisties, I guess. I just learned about the twisties, but it's the idea that your brain doesn't, can't really compute where your body is. And of course, for a gymnast, that's very, um, very difficult. So she decided that rather than potentially hurting herself, she would drop out of all of these different events. And that was super surprising. But I was even more surprised to hear what she tweeted or to read what she tweeted on Thursday. She said, the outpouring of love and support I've received has made me realize, and this is the important part, has made me realize I'm more than my accomplishments and gymnastics, which I never truly believed before. I'm more than my accomplishments and gymnastics, which I never truly believed before. So apparently, even achieving your way to being the best gymnast in history doesn't satisfy you. But it doesn't mean we don't try, right? I know I do. This is something that I struggle with a lot. Maybe you do too, that we just find ourselves trying to be satisfied in ways that will always be food that spoils rather than the bread of life. The writer Anna Quinlan gave a classic speech about achievement at 2000, in 2001 at Villanova University. This is what she wrote. This is a um, graduation speech, I believe. She says, I'm a novelist. My work is human nature. Real life is all I know. Don't ever confuse the two, your life and your work. The second, your work, is only part of the first, your life. Here's my resume. I am a good mother to three children. I have tried never to let my profession stand in the way of being a good parent. I no longer consider myself the center of the universe. I show up, I listen. I try to laugh. I am a good friend to my husband. I have tried to make my marriage vows mean what they say. So here's what I want to tell you today, she says. Get a life, a real life, not a manic pursuit of the next promotion, the bigger paycheck, the larger house. Get a life in which you smell when you notice the smell of salt water pushing itself on a breeze. 
a life in which you stop and watch how a red-tailed hawk circles over the water, or the way a baby scowls with concentration as she tries to pick up a Cheerio with her thumb and forefinger. Get a life. Jesus goes one step further. He says, get the bread of life. Back in our passage, the, um, the people there are still talking with Jesus and they ask Jesus for a sign because they still don't get it. They don't get, even by the end of the passage, I don't think they get what Jesus is trying to tell them. So they ask Jesus for a sign I mean, which makes me think, for heaven's sakes, the day before he just fed 5,000 people, but what has he done for them lately, right? So they ask him for a sign, but he doesn't give them that sign. He just tells them again to look for the bread that endures forever. The bread of heaven, the bread from God, the bread of life. He never gives them that sign just wonders why why would they settle for wonder bread when they can have italian garlic bread on the grill it's a whole long process to make it but boy is it worth it he doesn't give them a sign but he's given one to us this is the bread of life Everyone who eats of this bread and drinks of this cup will never be hungry, will never be thirsty again. This is Christ's body. This is Christ's blood. This is the food that satisfies us like nothing else can. This bread from heaven, there was a whole long process to make it. First, God had to love us from the beginning of the world. And then Jesus had to come as a little helpless baby who grew up to love us, forgive us, teach us, heal us. And then the next step was Jesus faced the cross so that we could be right with God. And the next step was Jesus rose from the dead and reigns in power and prays for us. It was a whole long process to make this bread. But this bread is the bread of life. Are you hungry yet? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us take this opportunity to give back.
Great and gracious God, we give you thanks for everything you have given to us. You provide for us in so many ways. And so God, take these offerings that we give back to you from our material blessings. Use them, O oh God, that this world would look more and more like the kingdom of heaven. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That song is a new song for me, but I love it because it says that, it reminds us that Jesus is here offering us this, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Jesus invites all of us to come forward, all of us to receive the gifts of God, all of us to take this bread and this cup. We don't have to achieve our way to this table. It's all grace. It's God's grace given to us because God loves us. Not because we finally got our act together, not because we were finally good enough for God to love us, but rather because God has come in Jesus Christ. We are welcomed to this table. Let us pray. Great and gracious God, we are so grateful that you created the whole world and called it good. We give you honor and praise because you put us in a beautiful garden and you made everything perfect around us. And when we turned from you, you did not turn from us. You called your people Israel out of all the peoples of the world, not because they were the best or the most powerful, but, oh God, because of your love for them. You blessed them to be a blessing to others. And when they turned away, you sent prophets and kings to draw them back to you. And then, Lord Jesus, you came at just the right time. Lord Jesus, you came as a helpless baby. You grew up to be the man from whom we learned about God. You taught us with parables. You healed us. You preached to us. You loved us. You challenged us. You forgave us. You were fully human and fully divine, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you not only understand our prayers, but you answer them. And so we lift up our prayers to you now, O oh God. We pray for the family whose um, funeral service is today, the couple. O oh God, we lift them up to you, all those who love them. We thank you for your promise that we are comforted when we grieve. We pray, O oh God, for all those around us who suffer and struggle from all sorts of maladies and difficulties. We pray, O oh God, for each other, those here in this room who are struggling with different things. And, O oh God, we pray for the war-torn areas of the world, the parts of the world that are experiencing hunger, places where um, where there is violence, destroying governments. Oh God, we pray that your church, that we ourselves and that your church would be a force in the world that would help the world to look more and more like the kingdom of heaven. We thank you, O oh God, Holy Spirit, that you not only empower us through this meal to serve you in the world, but you also lift us up into heaven. And so, oh Holy Spirit, we pray that you would do that just now that this bread and this cup would be Christ's body and Christ's blood for us. We thank you and we give you praise, O oh God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. We give you praise even as we pray the prayer that, you, that Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to take the bread from your package and remember that you are eating the bread of life. After supper, he took the cup. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, this cup is the cup of salvation shed for your sins. All of you drink from it. I invite you to take the cup that you have. The Apostle Paul tells us whenever we eat this bread and whenever we drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again and come again he will. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your body and your blood, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Lord Jesus, strengthen us that we would take your word into the world by what we say and by what we do, that the whole world would know you. We pray this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
this is the bread of life, why would we go anywhere else to be satisfied? Now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those whom you love and with all those who feel no love, both now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the postlude.